sure. Uh, mic activated and everything. Great. Uh, I'm off mute, Wonderful. so I guess so. <laughs> Perfect. Wonderful. Thanks a lot. Uh, I wanted to personally thank you again for presenting. This has been, uh, I've lost count of how many years now that you've, you've presented at uh, OLF, but uh, you've given us a whole lot of great talks uh, in the past, and I just wanted to thank you for uh, keeping that tradition going uh, in this uh, rather atypical year. Well, hopefully next year we'll be back to visiting in person, so fingers crossed. Absolutely, yeah. No, we're yeah, we're all hoping for that. So, uh, we'll we'll look forward and and expect us to see you again there. Okay. So, to kind of give you a little uh, introduction here. So, Dave Stokes is uh, the Amaya SQL Community Manager. He works at Oracle, and he travels a lot to to present about MySQL. Uh, he's the the author of a book about uh, MySQL and JSON, uh, which talks about the, the JSON data type and how it's handled uh, within MySQL. Oh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> Unfortunately, the background screened out. But, yeah, getting uh, <laughs> screened out. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he's got quite a you know quite a background. You, I, I see here you you talked about you started programming in Fortran on on punch cards. Uh, I actually was uh, as an engineering student, we used Fortran a lot. I did not use punch cards really, but uh, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm still a little bit old school when it comes to, to some of those things, but not as old school as, as some folks. Um, and uh, so he's gonna be talking about the, uh, the query optimizer in uh, MySQL and how you can how you can improve performance problems uh, that you may be encountering. Um, my own uses of databases and, and MySQL are, are not that complex. So uh, it's not something that I've encountered, but I know a lot of people talk about uh, they really need to optimize their, their database to reduce the load on their servers. So uh, it's gonna be really interesting to hear about uh, what they've done uh, in order to, to make ice uh, MySQL perform a lot better. So enough cool. from me and I will turn it over to Dave. Thank you. Well, thank you all for having me back and thanks for joining virtually. Uh, I got to warn you, I've set an alarm. Uh, this is a, a talk that I, I give that normally runs upwards of 90 minutes. So uh, to spare you, I've set a timer. Uh, if you have questions, please pop them up. I'll monitor Q&A as, as best I can. Uh, if you need to get a hold of me, here's my contact information. I am the MySQL Community Manager for North America. And uh, first thing I have to go over is the Oracle Safe Harbor Agreement. I am talking 99.9999% today about the free to download license to the GPL version two uh, MySQL community server and community software. However, if during question and answer, I go off in tangent on a future product uh, this is the legally saying, take that with a grain of salt. I don't have perfect knowledge of what's coming up. So we'll get past that real quick. By the way, if you're running MySQL 5.6 next February, I believe it's the 5th or the 6th of February, uh, MySQL 5.6 reaches end of life status. No more bug fixes, no more support. Uh, you are officially running dinosaur equipment. And as someone who loves vintage cars and vintage, vintage guitars and vintage motorcycles, uh, believe me, the older the things are, the harder they are to get repaired and to find parts for. Uh, plus, it's, it's harder to find people who know how to work those old versions. So if you're running 5.6, please update. Uh, by the way, if you're interested in trying the MySQL database service, uh, you can get $300 in credits uh, free. Uh, just go to that website and you get a full version of the MySQL Enterprise Edition, which means you get enterprise backup, the uh, encryption stuff and all that. Uh, $300 uh, with, some, with one or two instances will last you quite a while. And uh, so what is this session about? Well, very rarely do I ever hear anyone complain that, you know, this database is just running too darn fast. My applications just can't keep up. Um, speeding up queries, if you uh, follow certain uh, websites, um, which I won't name, um, <coughs> Stack Overflow, um, you'll, you'll see that... Uh, a lot of folks see it as a dark art. It's not a dark art. It's, it's kind of a misguided science, but it's not a dark art. 
Uh, the understanding how to speed up queries is often seen as, a, as, as magic, but it's really not. And we're gonna look at the proper uses of indexes, histograms, locking options, and some of the other ways to speed up queries. Uh, one of the problems that I see is that this is a very dry subject. I mean, we're talking stack uh, dump tracing dry for assembly language uh, level stuff. Uh, very, very dry. If you don't catch it the first time you walk through this, uh, this is recorded, watch it again, the slides are online. Uh, by, by the way, the link down at the bottom in red is uh, where you can get the, the uh, slides. I also just tweeted it. Um, also, this is a presentation with lots of text on screen. I'm sorry, there's really no other way to, uh, to give this information over. If I could do it with sock puppets, I would. Um, now, uh, something else we're not gonna cover today is system configuration of your OS. Uh, I'm not gonna cover the con configuration of MySQL. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about hardware. There are wonderful talks out there on hardware. Uh, things like disk buffers that lie to you, um, throughput channels that aren't quite working the way. And also networking. If you're doing a lot of replication and you're also running DNS and LDAP services on the same network segment, uh, your database is occasionally going to have problems that aren't really related to the database, but it will be blamed on the database. Also not talking today about normalizing your data. Uh, in the relational world, you want to set up your data with minimum redundancies. And by doing this, you have it in manageable chunks that work with set theory, uh, thus relational calculus. And believe it or not, the math actually does work. Um, unfortunately, can't go into that today because we only got uh, 30 some odd minutes. And what I'd like to emphasize is that you can't build a skyscraper on a sandy beach. It's just not going to take the pressure and it's going to collapse on you. Uh, for normalization, I recommend third form or normal. I am now recommending using JSON columns for stubbed information. Uh, if you have to make multiple dives to get uh, your customer's billing address, for instance, uh, you might want to slightly denormalize by using a JSON column. Also think about how you're gonna use your data. Uh, if you're recording a whole bunch of sales uh, from cash register data and you're gonna do time series analysis, that's gonna be a little bit different than if you're gonna go back, go back and do some transactional analysis. Uh, once again, don't eat fork with a, don't use a fork to eat your soup. By the way, badly normalized data will hurt the performance of your queries. No matter how much training you give, a, give it, a dachshund will not be faster than a thoroughbred horse. Okay, the optimizer. Uh, consider the optimizer the brain and nervous system of the database. It uh, wants to look at your query and try to figure out the fastest, most inexpensive way to get your data to you. Uh, the trouble here is that um, this is quite a complex problem. Uh, there's lots of uh, academic papers come out on this every week. And most are built on a cost model. That uh, mathematical cost model is based on uh, basically disk reads, because that used to be the slowest thing in the entire chain, and that's what we're still using it for. And there's some advances in that, but that's a little too uh, crazy for this talk. Now, the optimizer wants to look at every option. Uh, you give it a query, it tears it apart, and it says, okay, I know where this piece of information is, I know where this piece of information is, what's the shortest way between them? And it's kind of like a GPS positioning, uh, GPS in your phone or your car. Uh, it's built on historical statistics. Uh, these statistics are, uh, are great, but uh, if I want to go to the local, uh, my local favorite restaurant, it's left out of the driveway right at the uh, end of the street over the railroad tracks and the restaurant's right on the left. Well, my GPS doesn't know that the train's uh, parked across the tracks, doesn't know that the guy two houses down had a water uh, leak and flooded out the road. So historical information is great, but it doesn't always help. Uh, if you're adding a lot of data or changing a lot of data, uh, the optimizer can easily get confused. By the way, MySQL wants to optimize each query every time it sees it. There's no locking down the query plan like in Oracle. Uh, later in this presentation, look for optimizer hints if you want to see how there's a way kind of how to do that. Oh, by the way, I will teach you how to look at a query plan and how to get it. So if your query has five joins, the optimizer has 100 well, has five factorial or 120 different options just for the joins. That doesn't get into anything on the right-hand side of the where clause. So if you have 120 different ways you can assemble that thing, you have the ultimate Ikea slash Lego nightmare. But uh, there are th heuristics that the optimizer follows. Now for you, you're gonna end up using something called explain. 
Now explain something that I could teach in a two week class and kind of get the major highlights on. Uh, in five minutes, I'm not gonna be able to get to too much, but I'll kind of give you the oversight. Uh, this is the syntax of explain. By the way, that's our new shell on the right-hand side, which has command completion and wonderful uh, uh, help section there. Uh, by the way, if you go through the MySQL manual, it's worth reading chapter eight if you're uh, trying to figure out how to get a handle on this. It explains a lot of it in detail. There's some books that I'll mention later that are, are worth pursuing. Now, the trouble with explain is there's different types of explain. Uh, we have straight explain, explain with different formats, explain, analyze, and visual explain. This is an example of running explain on a query. Uh, Hopefully you can see my, my mouse bouncing around here. Ex put explain in front of the query, explain select from star, select star from the table city where country code equals GBR. That's my actual query. Over here are the details that the optimizer gives back from explain. It's saying, well, we're hitting the table city. Uh, we have a reference in here, the reference is to country code equals GBR. Possible keys we could use or indexes is country code. By the way, that uh, index length of three, we'll get into why the length count is uh, important later. Uh, filtered, we'll go into that a little bit later. But down here is the actual query plan where the optimizer takes what you gave it up here and rewrites it so that the database can return what you asked for. Once again, if you don't get this the first time through, uh, watch again, go through the slide deck, uh, play with it. Visual Explain comes with MySQL Workbench, which is another free tool that we have. And that's basically the same information, just in a graphical format. Uh, by the way, green boxes usually are good. Uh, red boxes mean you have to have a little bit of concern. Well, we also have tree format. Uh, this will tell you that uh, this is a slightly different query. It's using something called a hash join between two tables. In this case, we're going to have the table city joined to the table called country. And we're going to... Um, mash those together. And this is coming back with some information on uh, the relative costs of the various, uh, various optimizations or the joinings that we're doing. Uh, format equals JSON, this gives you even more information. I don't think any of you are probably going to want this level of information, maybe in a couple of years. So it's nice to show you that it's here. Uh, once again, it tells us the table we're going after, the number of rows it's going to have to scan. Uh, over here, it says we're getting a hash join, uh, the read cost, the evaluation cost, uh, prefix cost, uh, data read per join is gonna be six megabytes. So the information's out there, it's just learning how to decipher it. Now, something we did add in MySQL 8018, by the way, the latest is 8022, so this has been out there for a bit over a year. Uh, normally, Explain uses historical information. Explain Analyze actually goes out and runs your query. Uh, so big warning, if you have a big nasty analytics uh, query that you think is gonna run for a couple hours and suck up all the memory, uh, probably better to avoid this during uh, business hours. So explain analyze, goes out there and runs the query and comes back and gives you the actual time. By the way, if you are uh, playing with explain and explain analyze and know a big variance between actual time and the time that the estimate is, uh, run explain analyze on the table and double check the indexes uh, just to make sure they're they're not mismatched in size or, or data type. And that should clean up things a bit for you. So more on using explain later uh, on to something else even more fun. Indexes. Uh, oftentimes uh, you see people throw indexes at a database because they've read somewhere that indexing makes everything faster. And indexes do let you track down things faster. However, uh, there are some problems with indexes. There's some overhead and often people apply indexes poorly. Let's see, nothing on the QA right now. So think of the index as a table with shortcuts to another table. Uh, so someone comes and looks up the vehicle identification number of your car, that's an index into another table that actually has the real data on your car. So the, the uh, Index is actually kind of a, uh, a small junior version of the table. Uh, by the way, the more indexes and tables you have, uh, the more this database wants to have them in memory and the more memory is taken up. Uh, by the way, if you've never heard this before, databases love memory more than a faster processor. So memory is where you spend your, your money. So MySQL has many types of indexes. Uh, once again, this is the syntax for creating indexes. Uh, we have unique, full text, spatial, 
a uh, whole bunch of qualifiers, algorithms, um, block sizes, uh, whether you want to be a B tree or a hash, but that's kind of beyond the pale for today. So let's create a simple table with a primary key. Uh, MySQL's main storage engine, InnoDB, prefers to have a primary key. If you don't specify one, it will pick one. Uh, it will make up a dummy one, and I can guarantee you it will not be performant. Uh, so pick your own primary key. So we have a simple table here, a table called T1. We have three columns. Uh, the first one's an integer. We're saying it's not null. I'll go into null later. Uh, we're going to auto increment. So every time we input a row of data, it's going to take whatever the previous value was and increment it by whatever you set it to be, usually a one. And we're going to call this our primary key. So this is how we're going to look up most of the data on this table. And then we have two other columns. Now, an index is a list of keys, and you'll, also, you'll often hear them used interchangeably, uh, which can kind of get confusing. But um, there is a slight difference, but in the MySQL world, you can kind of use them interchangeably. So don't worry about that if uh, you see key and think index or vice versa. Now, the primary key is one that's hopefully uniquely defined for a row and should be immutable. Uh, you don't want to go back and up those move stuff around later. Uh, as I mentioned before, InnoDB wants a primary key very badly. And please don't use null values. I'll get into that in another thing. Also, it wants the numbers to monotonically increase. Uh, that's like going 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 10, 20, 30, 40. Uh, if you really, really love UUIDs, which do not monotonically increase and are kind of a waste of space, uh, we have a function called UUID to bin, uh, which will uh, let you work with MySQL efficiently. So something else you can do is you can actually index on the prefix of a column. Uh, sometimes getting right in the rough area is close enough. Um, say like you have last names that are 75 characters long, but you do some analysis on that and you find out that 99.9% .9 of your customers, uh, the, after the first 10 characters, there's very little things that aren't unique. Uh, you might have 24, five um, von Bluchensteins, but, if you get the von Bluch, you you're pretty good, uh, pretty good close to the records that you want. So in this case, we're going to uh, create an index part of name on the customer field, and we're going to only use the first ten characters of the name column. Uh, you can also have multi-column indexes. In this uh, table, we have columns for last name and first name, so we're going to create an index last name then first name. So to use this column, we can search on last name and first name or just last name. It won't work on just first name. Uh, it kind of works left to right. So put the highest cardinality index on the first field. Uh, if you're using year, month, day, uh, that index will work on year, month, day, year, month, and year, but not month, day, or just day, or just month. By the way, if you have questions, pop them up on q and I'll uh, check on that uh, when, when I can. Hashing values. Sometimes you have data that just doesn't quite fit uh, that mold. So what you can do is you can uh, concat, in this example, we're concatting two values and using MD5 hash. Uh, sometimes um, things just don't work out the way you want. Also, you can have uh, things called a covering index where the index will cover all the values you need to return a query. You don't actually have to dive into the data table itself. Um, I mentioned that a little bit before I went to the slide. Uh, unique indexes, there's only one value per row. Um, full text indexes, if you're doing text searches, we can do uh, with an ODB uh, a full text search. That's pretty interesting. One of the interesting features is you can actually say uh, the first word that you're searching for has to be within X numbers of the number of words of the second one. Uh, secondary indexes, this is um, your you have your primary index and you have something else in that column you've indexed, maybe the, the customer zip code. Well, that secondary index will actually point to the entry for the primary index entry for the table. And spatial indexes, these are actually R trees for GIS type data. Uh, very interesting, but not what we're covering today in detail. Also, we have functional indexes. Um, here's some examples. Uh, functional indexes are or the result of some sort of function. So if you want to round up to the nearest 100 to be able to uh, give people price cost breaks, um, or you want to sub two things, 
uh, the second example here, call one plus call two. So that's the cost of goods sold and the shipping costs. So you have a rough idea of what your uh, costs are. Uh, Multi-value indexes came out fairly recently. Uh, with the JSON data type, we had a lot of people putting in uh, very extensive JSON documents with arrays in there. And before multi-value indexes, every index entry could only point to one row in a data table. Well, with all these uh, arrays, that didn't quite make sense. So with multi-value indexes, you could now have more index pointers than, uh, than rows. And in this example here, we're looking for uh, the value of three in that JSON array. By the way, uh, that really pays off above about 20 million rows. Uh, the speed is just absolutely amazing. So MySQL has two main types of index structures. Uh, the balanced tree, which you see on the left there, uh, values zero to 40 here, point off on this left branch. And that's further broken down. Um, it's a binary search. Uh, it's worked well for, for several years. Uh, hash joins, basically um, they're more efficient than the traditional nested loop join that MySQL is known for. Um, um, you'll see a lot of your queries once you get running, I think it was 8018, um, 8019 era, uh, just suddenly start running a lot faster because the hash joins are automatic. Now, please keep in mind, uh, the optimizer is a complicated piece of software, but some of the heuristics are not exactly um, uh, enlightened. Uh, if there is a choice between multiple indexes on joining tables or searching for something, uh, MySQL normally grabs the index with the smallest number of rows. Uh, hope, and hopefully thinking it's the most selective. Uh, MySQL can use indexes on columns more efficiently if they're declared as, declared as the same type and size. So compare apples with apples, bananas with bananas. Uh, varchar and car are great, but doing varchar and say a, a um, real value or a decimal, it's gonna have to be cast and each row is gonna have to be cast. So you can see where that adds extra complexity there. Uh, by the way, check your string collations and character sets. Uh, for instance, if I'm doing something with UTF-8 MB4 and I'm combining it with Latin one, um, it kind of gets messy. Things have to be um, set up and evaluated separately. It's just not an easy comparison. Okay, null. Back in the early days of structured query language, they wanted a way to represent that they didn't know something. So uh, they came up with the idea of null. Uh, the old binary trick was zero for false, one for true, and don't know null. Uh, great idea. The only trouble is null has kind of um, some nasty side effects. Uh, this is a nice visual example of, of um, what null can mean to a lot of folks. Uh, it's not exactly true, but it's, uh, it's, it's cute. So if you have a column that you're indexing and you have a whole bunch of null values in there, uh, it's kind of like you go through the kitchen looking for a knife and you know it's not with the rest of the silverware and you eventually have to get down to the junk drawer and between pulling out the, uh, the flashlights holding dead batteries and that old strip of Velcro that you're going to use for something, somewhere in that junk drawer are your null values. So it, they're not very efficient. So uh, please avoid nulls in your primary keys and your indexes. Invisible indexes. Uh, this is something when I heard about I thought, that's kind of a weird idea. What is an invisible index? Well, in the past, if you were uh, trying to figure out if an index was helping you, what you would do is you look at that index and say, I don't know if you're a good index or not. You'd run explain on your query. You'd remove that index, just uh, delete it. Uh, run rerun explain. And while you're looking at the output to explain, you get phone calls, texts, screams from down the hallway. Uh, especially from a power user about their their query suddenly running very slowly. I uh, guess what? They're using that index. Well, you uh, decide that you need to get that index back and it can take seconds, minutes, hours, days, uh, hopefully not longer than a, a couple minutes, but sometimes it takes longer to rebuild that index. Well, after invisible indexes, uh, what you can do is look at that index, say, I'm doubtful about your use, uh, run explain, make the index invisible. The optimizer can no longer see that index. It's a, uh, a um, 
server-wide blank out of that index. Rerun explain. Suddenly you start getting the text screams uh, from the power user about slow query. You make the index visible again. Power user's happy. Everyone goes along their way. And you start blaming it on the network, JavaScript, GDPR, or Slack, or the cloud. Um, by the way, the sys schema, which is something you can look up using MySQL Workbench, will show you which indexes have not been used and are candidates for removal. They'll also show you queries that are running without indexes that are candidates to be indexed. Uh, for the removal ones, um, I always urge caution. Uh, make a big backup or two before you delete them, and I recommend turn them invisible. By the way, after a reboot, it's not a good time to look at the uh, the statistics because the statistics are historical and get wiped out after a uh, reboot. So if you see an index that hasn't been used in um, two weeks, uh, maybe because it was after a reboot. By the way, some indexes are out there that are only used once a quarter or once a year. So be careful before you blow anything away. How to use invisible index, real simple. Alter table, uh, table name, and name the index and make it invisible. Then if you want to turn it visible, it's just reverse. Histograms, uh, this is something that came out with 8.0. So it's been out here since eight, April of 2018. They're uh, kind of a, a different way of looking at things, kind of the, uh, the other end of the spectrum from indexes. And no, they're not gluten-free or keto-friendly. Uh, this is a histogram of the heights of 10,000 US females. And as you see here, the height tends to center around these two values and peak off at about 3,000 women at, I'm guessing that's 165 centimeters. So Wikipedia says the histogram is an accurate representation of the distribution of numerical data. Uh, this means the optimizer knows where your data is. Uh, if it doesn't have the statistics, it kind of has to search around and find everything. So the histograms help the optimizer find the most efficient query plan to fetch the data. Now there are two types, singleton and equihite. Uh, by the way, it's going to, a histogram is going to do, divide up your data into logical buckets. And uh, histograms are primarily useful for non-index columns. Uh, if the data doesn't churn a lot or doesn't churn at all, I'd recommend using a histogram over an index. By the way, every time you update, delete, or uh, modify an index entry, there's overhead there. And if you have several indexes on a table and you're doing lots of updates, uh, things can slow down there. Histograms don't have that. And that's kind of the reason there. By the way, uh, occasionally the optimizer will make index dives to double check the statistics on indexes. Uh, the system does not actually double check with you to make sure if it's okay to do that just after you left for lunch or go home for the long weekend. Uh, so uh, index dives happen when you don't expect them and they can impact performance. Okay. Um, occasionally the optimizer fails to find the most efficient plan and ends up spending a lot of time executing the query um, that is necessary. Oh, I need to go back on histograms. Uh, the two types, equa height. Uh, so like you have a hundred entries and you set it up in four buckets, you know that each of those four buckets is gonna have 25 entries. Or you have 36 entries and all the entries are alphabetized. So you know that all the entries that start with an A are gonna be in bucket A. So the optimizer assumes that the data is evenly distributed in columns, which might not be true. Um, there's all sorts of, um, of uh, interesting data analysis tools that go along with this. So, the optimizer often doesn't have enough information on you know, how many rows are in each table and their distribution. So once again, the two types of histograms, equihite, one bucket is a range of values. Uh, once again, uh, we have an example here of using, having people line up A to G, H to L, M to T, U to Z. Uh, singleton, one bucket represents a single value um, of that. So here's an example of uh, doing a frequency histogram. Uh, we're going to have three buckets, 101, 102, 103. Don't happen to know what happened to 104. We're going to insert into a table two 101s, three 102s, and one 104. So if we do a select from our table, we see that we have the two 101s, the three 102s, and the one 104. And we create a histogram with three buckets. Now the optimizer knows that if we're looking for something that has 
uh, a value of 101, it's going to be somewhere in the first third of all the data. If it's looking for something that's 101 or, or 102, it knows it's going to be somewhere in the first 83% of the data. And anything with 104 is going to be in the first 100% of the data. By the way, this is a singleton histogram. Now, uh, looking at the statistics of this, um, the cumulative frequency, we know that 101 is 33% of our, of our data. And we know that 102, the cumulative frequency is 83%, even though it's only 50% of our data. But this gives the optimizer a better chance of finding your data uh, very quickly, very efficiently. Uh, easy to create and remove histograms. Uh, first example here, analyze table, update histograms on table on columns one, C1, C2, and C3, each having 10 buckets. Uh, and we can also come back later and redo the histogram uh, on C1 and C2. And we can decide that we don't really need a histogram on C2. So these are three different histograms on three different columns. Uh, if you want information on histograms, they're out there uh, in our uh, information schema. Uh, they can tell you the table name, the population, the, the data type you're looking at, and the bucket count. Now, where histograms sign, you'll have to give, forgive me for giving this kind of elaborate demonstration. We're going to create another simple table. Uh, we're going to have in that table two values of one, three values of two, and three values of three. So two ones, three twos, and four threes. Uh, without a histogram, we run explain. We're going to explain select star from our table where x is greater than zero. And remember that all our values are greater than zero. The Optimizer without a histogram is going to go, well, we know the table has nine rows in there, and I'm going to guess that I know where it is. I know where it's going. I'm going to have to read at least a third of the table to get the information. Well, we know that all the values are greater than that. So um, the, the filtered value here is kind of a uh, estimated percentage of the table rows that need to be um, looked at. Now, where the histogram shines is we go ahead and create a histogram on our table with three buckets. Now, when we run the explain on there, it knows where all the data is. It, it says, yeah, I, I know where I'm gonna have to go. I'm gonna have to get all the data. Now, if you run explain analyze, uh, we'll come back and give you the actual uh, costs and the time that it takes to run everything. Now, I'm kind of running, uh, down in my last five minutes before I go to a dedicated Q&A. Uh, by the way, if you do have questions, uh, please pop them in the Q&A. Uh, there are other tweaks you can do to speed things up. Uh, you can use explain to see what your query is doing. Are there file sorts, full table scans, temporary tables? Uh, do the join orders look right? Uh, the, the configuration side, are the buffers and caches big enough? Do you have enough memory? Uh, are, your, are your disks just slow? Uh, that still happens these days. Uh, something you do is we've made two changes to locking in MySQL 8.0, uh, no wait and skip lock. Uh, this might help you rechange the way you use your data. Uh, for example, here, we want to buy some concert tickets and we're going to start a transaction and we're going to go out and select a seat and a row and we're going to grab the cost while we're at it from a table called seats. And what we want to do is we're looking for seat numbers three and four in rows five and six that are not booked. Now we want to grab them because we want to book them. And this will automatically skip over the lock tables. Before this, the database would wait until those rows became available. Lock no wait basically says, if there's nothing there, immediately return to me. Now, other ways you can do, oops, I got a question. Let's see. Uh, is there a link to the 90 minute full version of the talk that you have mentioned in the beginning? Uh, yes, I'll have to look it up though and I will post it on my Twitter at Stoker. Um, let me type that. Okay, so got that out there. Okay, other fast ways, resource groups, optimizer hints, partitioning. And resource groups. This is where you can dedicate uh, virtual CPUs uh, 
to certain classes of queries. On this example, we create a batch uh, group and we dedicate two CPUs and set it to a low thread priority. So every time we set a resource group batch in a, in a series of commands, or we put in this optimizer hint, the stuff here in Magenta, the optimizer knows to uh, set those to go to that, to that lower priority. Optimizer hints. Uh, these are uh, little comments you can put into your, your query. So like you know, it's better to join T1 to T2 than T2 to T1. Uh, the optimizer will see this. Hopefully it will know that you're, you uh, know what you're doing and away you go. Uh, partitioning, you can actually divvy up your data over various partitions if you're running the NODB or our NDB storage engines. Uh, so if you wanna keep the data for the last quarter on uh, partition A, uh, stuff for the previous three quarters on another partition, and stuff for years past on yet another set of disks, uh, you can do that. Uh, the optimizer knows about that and knows how to go grab it off the various partitions. Okay, um, this is an interesting example of what the optimizer actually does. Uh, this is our query. We're gonna go out and we're gonna select city.name from the city table, country.name from the country table. Now these two tables have been set up so that city.country code is the hook into the country table using the code column. And we only want to know the city names for GBR, where the country code is equal to GBR. So once again, we're looking for city name, country name from these two tables. That's how we're matching them up. And this is a, a qualifier. So if we run explain on this, it comes back and tells us, yes, you're, you're doing this on two tables, country and city. Uh, notice that country is a smaller table, so it's gonna kind of look at that first. Now the actual query plan that we get is select world.city.name as name. Uh, world, by the way, is a scheme or a database. We have all this. And United Kingdom as name. So that country.name, it's automatically rewritten that for us. So it's already done some magic for us, even on a very simple query such as this. Uh, if you run explain analyze, it will go out and give us the real cost of how everything runs. Now, oops, there was my timer. Um, let me uh, run through this one slide. Uh, learning to read this um, is kind of hard. I have some books that I will get to that I recommend that uh, you're gonna have to, these are exercises I run through. Um, by the way, uh, where else to look for information? The MySQL manual, forums.mysql.com. Also, we have a MySQL community Slack. Please join, you're part of the community now that you've sat through this. Great book, you need this book. Uh, Jesper Wisberg Crow uh, used to work at our support group. Uh, the book's about five inches thick. I'm on my second rereading of it. I'm still learning stuff, very interesting. Uh, this is an older book. If you're running older versions of MySQL, it's getting dated along in the tooth. A lot of things have changed. Uh, this is my book if you're using JSON and MySQL. Uh, by the way, if you are a startup, Oracle can help you. Uh, they have this wonderful program where they give you lots of credits and lots of help. Uh, if you are a startup, please take a look at that. And with that, um, there's my contact information. And once again, the slides are there and I will get the, uh, the longer link out there for the Q&A. And with that, I've got the Q&A window if there's any questions. I can say more about the benefits of histogram versus index when your data doesn't churn. I don't follow the logic. Okay, indexes are designed, uh, I used to, be able to use the, uh, the library reference card system, but very few libraries actually have those anymore where they actually have cards. Um, histograms, you kind of uh, divvy up your, your data in buckets so that you know, uh, you know the A's are over here, B's are over there and all that. Uh, indexes, as soon as you insert a piece of data, there's a new index entry in there. Um, what I mean by don't churn is indexes are better when you're you're adding or changing a lot of data. Uh, histograms, you make the histogram once. You, you throw them in the bucket A and it doesn't know that if you change the last name from Adams to Jorgensen that the name has changed. You'd have to rerun the histogram on that. Uh, I missed the, in the output. Um, oops, since I answered that. Okay, uh, now the second question I have, I missed in the output explanation of what is the cost? Well, cost-based optimizers have been around for 40 some odd years. And the idea is that 
you want to get the data back from your query at the lowest cost, cost being disk reads, because disk reads are very, very slow. Uh, disk reads are 100,000 times slower than reading out of memory. So you kind of go for the, um, the, the, the worst case scenario there. Let's see, thank you, Carl and Catherine. Um, if there's any other questions, I'll be here for a while. And if you have any questions, uh, please do not hes hesitate to ping me, uh, david.stokes at Oracle. Uh, I have a blog at elephantdolphin.blogspot.com. I'm at Stoker on Twitter. Uh, once again, please join the MySQL community Slack. Uh, a lot of our engineers hang out there. So if you have a question about the optimizer, the new shell, replication, uh, anything like that, um, you're more than, more than uh, welcome to join us. And back to Nixie Advance. Thank you very much, David. Uh, again, another great talk. It's always it's always good to hear about uh, about MySQL. And we, you know, I know a lot of people uh, encounter performance uh, problems where they scale up, and and it, it just uh, it, it tends to be one of those bottlenecks. So uh, it's always great when there are are new. Uh, optimizations that, that become available. Uh, so I think uh, Nixie is, is also up. Uh, great to have you rejoin us. Thank you so very much. Thank you guys for letting me take a minute to talk to my YouTube channel because we kind of came on here super quick. Um, I, I really appreciate that. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, oh, yeah, we don't have much time, do we? I have, no, no. I have our schedule printed out on a piece of paper because I'm old school like that. And <laughs> all righty. Yeah, just a couple of minutes. Um, I did want to make an announcement. So uh, oh, we, yes. we were, uh, we did add uh, just within uh, the last half an hour, we've added a, a shop to the website. So if you go to olfconference.org slash shop, um, or if there's a link at the, the top of the page uh, for the shop. And uh, you'll be able to get one of those masks for $10. <laughs> uh, that includes shipping to uh, anywhere in the US. I'm not sure if we're set up, set up for, for international, but uh, uh, at least there's uh, a limited supply, at least of, the, of, the, um, of those at the current time. Um, also, uh, the, the shirts. Uh, those are going to be available if you sign up for the supporter pass. So that is actually still open for registration. If you want to go and, and register as a supporter, uh, you'll get the, the mask and the t-shirt and uh, I think maybe some other things. I'm not exactly 100% sure of what we're sending out to, to all those folks, but uh, that'll, that'll get you those. Um, but if you've registered as an enthusiast, uh, you can buy the mask just individually. Wait, there's this. Sorry about that. Oh yeah, the, uh, she threw that in there. Hang on one sec. The luggage tags, yeah, the uh, uh, that were quote unquote the badge for this year. I know a lot of people like the badges that we normally print for uh, our experience, and uh, it's it's a, a little bit less colorful than the ones that we normally have, but uh, it, it's a, an acceptable substitute. Oh, you know what? I can't wear the mask, but the Snorlax can, <laughs> except it will. And you have to make sure you guys, when you wear masks, it has to cover your nose and mouth. I know people were wondering about that. Not your eyes though. That, that's, yeah. that's, that's not <laughs> that's ideal. There probably go. not a good thing to do. Snorlax, uh, you're not cooperating. <laughs> do we have yeah, time I think for the, me uh, to ask you? Oh, sorry, Vance. Do we no, have... I was gonna... Go ahead. No, you're good. Uh, there, how about that? <laughs> Do you have uh, time for me to ask you about your first experience with Linux or are we ready to roll? Um, no, we do have a couple of minutes here and, and that's actually a good question. Uh, while we were looking at, uh, at Beth Lynn's video, we, I actually saw she had a, a book laying on the uh, shelf behind her. I saw that too, actually. And, yeah. Good call. Uh, it, it reminded me and I, I went to my bookshelf and I pulled out, um, this is in, in 1997. 
uh, I went to an actual bookstore. Some of our younger viewers may not know what that is, but it's a building <laughs> where they uh, sell these things. And uh, yeah, so I bought this, this uh, Linux configuration and installation uh, written by Patrick Volkerding and uh, who else? Uh, Kevin Reichard and Eric Johnson. And it included uh, Slackware 3.2. I think you can see on the- Wait, is that your, fir is that your first book? That was the first Linux distribution book? I ever I ever used. That was uh, uh, 1997. So oh, uh, how cool! Absolutely, yeah. It was it was it was started me on a, a journey now that's that's been going for uh, yeah a lot longer. <laughs> I, I love that. Once I, I started that. to do the math. <laughs> a lot longer. That is for sure. Um, yeah, it's interesting, the philosophy, I kind of want to talk a little bit about the philosophy around, I mean, well, here, how about this? Do you use Linux every day? And if so, in what capacity? Do you use it for work? Do you find yeah, that you so don't use? I work in, in an environment that is 100% uh, uh, Windows, or at least, uh, I, I, I imagine there may be some Linux users, but uh, I don't actually work in, in IT. Uh, and yeah, all, all our environment is, is Windows, but all of my computers that I have uh, at home that I run, or at least the, the non-work related ones now that, now that I'm working from home, uh, yeah, are, right. are all running Linux. So uh, yeah, it, it's been really a, a more of a personal interest than a, a professional one for me. Yeah, that um, for me too, definitely. Like, in fact, Linux has in some way prohibited a lot of what I do. Um, I tried very hard, and I explained this to my my following earlier to like use uh, open source tools for video editing, and it's just not there. It's it's so close. If you guys, if anybody in the chat in either of the chats and any of the chats have any suggestions on open source video editing tools, I am all ears <laughs> because I would love to find, I've tried OpenShot, Caden Live. Um, oh gosh, there was another one that had a really long name that was made by one guy. <laughs> but um, yeah, I would love to see like the video editing world go, go up get up to that level. Do we have time for another question? I have another one. Um, I, maybe if we make it quick. Uh, oh. oh, no, that's I okay. I think we if have we're... Patrick, uh, we have Patrick up and, and maybe if we can. Uh... I'll ask him, how about that? The year okay. of the Linux desktop question. That's coming up next. <laughs> okay, uh, so Patrick Schuff, uh, his background has been uh, he worked at uh, Facebook for, for over six years in, in California uh, in their infrastructure teams, uh, working on content delivery systems. And then after that, he worked at uh, Netflix as well. So he definitely has uh, a, lot of, a lot of knowledge and experience trying to figure out how we, how we deliver uh, content to end users uh, over the internet. Um, he's currently the chief technology officer at efuse.gg, which is a uh, Columbus-based startup uh, that's building a professional hub for esports and video games. So I want to, and he's going to be talking about, you know, how does information get uh, transmitted over the internet? Uh, how did the internet begin, and what actually happens when you go to a web page and you know, click play to try to start a movie or, or anything, any kind of sort of content like that. So please take it away, Patrick. Awesome. You guys have my screen and everything good? Yep. We can see All your right. uh, slides. Great. Thank you. Thanks, fans. Appreciate it. Um, yeah. Th thanks for the introduction. Um, again, my name is Patrick Schuff. And um, today I will be um, sharing hopefully a, a useful kind of a, a story or analogy of, of how the internet works um, and how the internet sometimes doesn't work. And um, this is my, I believe, fourth time uh, speaking at OLF. I look forward to it every year and I'm really you know, happy that the team was able to you know, put this together. It's, it's really great and uh, really, really looking forward to it. So, um, so you know, with that, um, I will uh, just kind of dive in and, and, and we'll go through it. So, whoops. 
Um, so I, I did have a really cool uh, video to show here, but it doesn't look like my internet's working. Uh, this is a joke where if I was a live audience, everybody go crazy and hoot and holler. But um, here we are. So, so who am I and why, you know, do I, you know, why am I up here talking about the internet? So I'm going to give a, a kind of a brief introduction um, to myself. I've been very fortunate to, um, to, to one, have um, grown up around computers uh, for much of my life. I, my first computer was a Commodore 64, long, long time ago. Um, so I've just always kind of had computers around. And um, with that, um, in my career, um, both here in, in Ohio and Columbus, and, and I also um, spent a few years at um, two really big tech companies who combined, or even just uh, separately, they comprise a really sizable portion of the internet traffic uh, and you know, the bits delivered over the internet at any, on any given day. So um, kind of fast forward to 2006, um, I joined uh, Ohio State uh, as a, uh, an undergraduate in the computer science and, and engineering. So having grown up around computers for a long time, I really, uh, you know, I kind of knew I was going to go into computers in some capacity and CSE just kind of made the most sense uh, in terms of kind of a mixture of theory and actual practical application. And it was in 2006, and I'll, I'll, I'll wait till the end to share my first experience with Linux, um, so I remember it well. Um, about 2006 is when I really started using Linux for the first time, and um, it was actually uh, I, I kind of kind of fell into it um, because it was really really frustrating for me, and I was completely on Windows at the time. But um, it was so frustrating that I just decided to wipe every system I had from Windows and go to Linux. And you know, fast forward 15 plus almost 15 years later, it actually ended up being a really amazing career move for me. Um, also, while in school. Uh, I learned about Python. So that's, you know, I, I never really started coding um, in, a, in a real way until college. And it really wasn't until I learned Python that the world really opened up for me and things that I wanted to build and problems I needed to solve. The Python language helped me do that. Um, so I really, you know, I, I think like the late 2000s were really where um, I, 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 I I, I kind of, I guess, progressed in, in, in my career in a big way. And I want to add too, I was a very, very average um, student. Like I did the things I needed to get done, but I was much more interested in building things outside of the classroom. And that's really where kind of the roots of my Linux and, and, and software engineering background kind of stemmed from. So following college, um, again, I was using Linux and I was using it full time uh, all throughout school. And in 2011, I joined my uh, first full time um, company or my first full time job was with Nationwide Insurance on the Linux team. So we were essentially doing a lot of system administration work. And at the same time, I was able to automate a lot of the annoying, repetitive things um, that, you know, is involved in, in sysadmin. So doing a lot of Linux um, and, you know, kind of we had a few thousand servers that we managed at the time and it was you know really great for me to kind of apply all the things that i'd done previously in school you know at home to you know real world situations i'm only going to make one political statement um, throughout this whole presentation and it's with uh this slide here um i um i really prefer emacs so i'm i i i'm, I'm emacs over vim um i actually you know, as a sysadmin if you're really a good sysadmin you have to use vim all the time so still use vim all the time but um Emacs is, is uh, the editor that I prefer. Um, I will say these days I do use VS Code, but still have the Emacs key bindings. Cool. So um, at Nationwide, it was, uh, I was really uh, pretty happy there. I was working there about a year and a half, and I got hit up by a recruiter on LinkedIn um, from Facebook who asked me if I wanted to um, interview with them. So at the time, I didn't think I had a chance of getting a gig with them. Um, but fast forward two phone interviews, one flight out to Menlo Park, and five grueling on-site interviews later, I ended up getting a job full-time uh, with Facebook. So um, my uh, my fiance and now wife at the time, uh, or my now wife, uh, made the trek from Ohio to California. So I joined a team called the Global Site Reliability Team. And um, again, like I really, my background, I consider myself a Python and Linux person. Like I'm kind of sysadmin, you know, I have the Python knowledge, but um, in this role, we managed, um, I traded in a few thousand Linux servers at Nationwide to a few hundred thousand Linux servers at Facebook. So, you know, we were managing the global site. We didn't really own anything in, except the general reliability of Facebook. So um, I not only got exposed to really big distributed systems, um, which was a really great experience, but um, I also, what more importantly, and where I've learned way more in my career and any role that I've ever had is 
I got to see how things break. We were literally the 24 seven break fix team who had coverage here in the United States and also in Dublin, Ireland, who were involved in every single outage. So seeing distributed systems, how they're built and seeing how they break really, um, you know, it, it puts an impression on you and makes you, gives you a really good insight into how to build things and, and how not to build things. So one of the, um, I think one of the main goals of any engineer in any role that you're in is your job is to automate yourself out of your job. Like you should, you know, replace yourself with ideally code and then you can go move on to bigger, better problems. And a year and a half into Facebook, that's actually exactly what my team did. Um, we had about 20 engineers on the team where we were doing like literally, and this is crazy to think about even in 2012, but we were doing database migrations and like for, for you know, for Facebook. And we ended up automating all those things away and building systems to, to, to do that job. So that team actually dissolved and we got to go figure out where we wanted to, to, to go. And one of the areas that I thought was really interesting that I had very little in, um, knowledge of at the time was networking. And specifically, like, how does the internet work? How do people get to Facebook? And one of the really cool things that they had um, is, and it still exists to some extent today, is uh, you could actually send people from Facebook and from one continent and move them to an entire another continent by editing one line in a single file. And that was kind of fascinating to me. I needed, to, I wanted to know how it works. So I ended up joining the traffic and CDN team. So their job is to make sure no matter where you are in the world, whether you use Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, et cetera, um, when you use those apps, we know we detect where you are in the world. And that is not based on GPS location. Those don't matter at all. We base that based on the internet and where you're at located within the internet. So um, I ended up joining that team for a couple years and um, we ended up helping build out the global internet infrastructure and photo and video delivery uh, systems on that team. So if in the last eight or nine years you've ever seen any of these memes on Facebook and they got delivered to your phone or your website or your, your browser really fast, um, you're welcome. Um, I, 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 some of the teams that I, that I worked on um, you know, built those systems to, to make sure that delivery was really quickly. So um, the last team I worked on at Facebook was um, the disaster recovery team. Uh, so when you work on a site that big and you have a global presence as they do, um, one of the things that you need to think about is, and you, and you have a multi data center kind of region or you know, multi data center system, sorry, website, um, you need to think about disaster recovery. And one of the things that has happened many times is you know, big hurricanes have come through and um, you know, can wipe out an entire region, you know, an entire East Coast. So, I was on a team that we would go and simulate those types of events and um, make sure that Facebook stayed up. Cool. So going to 2018, um, I had a, my wife and I had a child in California, which set in motion um, our want to move back to Ohio. So um, at the time, I was trying to move back to uh, with Facebook um, to, to to work remote, which um, it didn't end up working out that way, which is which is kind of ironic because now they're, um, they want to lead the, uh, the remote workplace, um, I guess, in the industry, which is actually really cool. Um, but uh, since I wasn't able to do that with uh, Facebook, I ended up uh, deciding to join Netflix. So I joined their site reliability engineering team to, and which allowed me to move back to Ohio and work um, for them um, and, uh, and work on their video delivery team. So many of the things I was doing at Facebook, um, working um, and doing that with Netflix. So. Cool. So after moving back to Ohio uh, last year in 2019, uh, again, I was really happy at Netflix. I love the product. Um, I love the company. Um, but I, things have changed a lot in the time that I was gone from Ohio to California. And one of the things I wanted to do was just see what, you know, get the pulse of the, the community. Things had changed a lot in terms of startups, in terms of, uh, you know, conferences like this. They've grown crazy in a crazy amount. And I just wanted to see what people were working on. And so I met with a bunch of different folks, coffee and lunch, and I ended up meeting the co-founder and CEO, Matthew Benson at Ethos. Um, he explained to me, um, you know, kind of the mission of what they're trying to do. Um, and I ended up making the move from Netflix to join Ethos last year um, as the chief technology officer. So just to give you a really brief introduction to what they do, um, there's over 160 universities that either have varsity sports programs or building collegiate esports teams. So just like Ohio State has varsity football, they also have uh, a varsity League of Legends team where students are getting full ride scholarships to play um, games uh, on, on a full ride. So um, what EFUS is trying to do is help build that professional gaming resume to help find aspiring either professional players, collegiate players, or even, you know, people who are, are, are looking to, you know, you know, join a professional team, you know, help them, you know, build out their resume. And on the other side of it, we're working with um, college coaches, universities, and recruiters to help bring those opportunities to the industry, um, to the, the people on our platform. 
Um, we also have very much a, a community networking aspect of it as well. So um, all of that's based on Linux, Docker, um, ECS, Amazon. Um, so, but out of scope for the talk today. So um, this is going to be um, a slightly, a, a much higher level talk. Last year I gave a talk, um, advanced site reliability engineering networking. Um, it went very deep on the networking side. And um, this talk is gonna be much more high level. And we're gonna talk about how, kind of the origins of the internet um, and then applying it to something that I assume everybody's pretty co uh, comfortable or familiar with is ordering packages on Amazon and how do those packages get delivered to your home. So um, this is um, you know, where we'll be spending um, the, the, the next bit of our time. Um, and again, it is a lot higher level. If you're looking for a really deep TCP IP, you know, DNS related things. I definitely recommend going and looking at that talk last year, or um, I've done a global uh, global balancing talk as well um, while at Facebook. So let's um, assume that we're at Ohio State in the 70s or so. So you know we're we're here. We're um, we're we're working on research, and you know we're starting to build this local network um, around the campus. So you know researchers and and, and professors want to share. Uh, information, you know, between each other. So we build this local land, local area network, and everything's great. You know, Ohio State, you know, they're they're building this, you know, they're they're sharing research together, collaborating, and you know, overall life is pretty good. And at the same time, Indiana is doing the same thing, where you know, graduate students, professors, you know, they're all researching, collaborating, and you know, the 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 quality and the 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 speed at which they can do this research has really increased in a big way. So. Everything's great, but then all of a sudden, you know, both Indiana and Ohio State want to, you know, share information together. So they both have this local area network, this LAN, and but they want to figure out like how do we share this information without, you know, actually physically driving, you know, between the universities to to to, to be able to do this. So this is where um, what what we're going to do is we're going to create this internet or the inter network. So what we're gonna do here is we're just gonna actually physically run a cable between these two universities. We're gonna put two routers on each side of them and then they're going to be able to talk to each other. So this is awesome. So now these two really big institutions are gonna be able to collaborate much quicker, you know, we'll do research together and everything is great. So we've got this cable now and it's just between these two, but now there's more universities that want to join this network. So, you know, and they're also, you know, they're, they're building their local network as well. So Illinois jumps on board and then they physically, you know, connect to the other networks. And then Ohio University joins and then they connect to this network. And then as you can kind of see, and as you kind of probably envision the evolution of this um, is such that, you know, we have a big network of academic universities. And when people are looking at this from the outside, in particular, the service industry or, you know, the, the, the for-profit industries, they're like, wow, this is really amazing. We want to also, you know, collaborate with these universities and we can probably use this ourselves. We need to, you know, share information, you know, across our company, across our different, uh, you know, cities around the world. And then this is where the internet service provider is actually born. So, um, and then this is where, um, you know, let's just say Acmeco and, and these different companies, they, instead of just connecting directly to, you know, these different universities, there's this internet service provider and we're just going to say Spectrum. It wasn't Spectrum back then, but um, they're the ones that actually, you know, connect to this global internet network. Um, and then they sell that service to university or sorry, to um, these corporations outside. And, you know, as you can kind of imagine, it just kept growing, you know, more ISPs became, came up. Um, obviously, you know, in the, in the 90s, this became much more consumer based with, uh, with dial up internet, et cetera. And this is just kind of how the internet grew and, and you know, became what it is today. It is literally a bunch of, inter, of networks that are interconnected together with global routing tables to make sure the magic works um, on all the packets around, uh, you know, getting from, destination, uh, source to destination. So let's talk a little bit about the architecture of the internet. And first I'm gonna talk about or show you a visualization of the interstate system. So this is, um, back in the 70s, um, Dwight Eisenhower uh, base, uh, put a, um, a mandate or a, a directive out that we need to you know, create this interstate system 
so that we can not only um, not only for you know defense and military purposes, um, which other big countries have you know set precedent for in the past, but also to increase commerce and you know and and allow people and goods to move more freely and more quickly throughout the United States. So um, this is um, approximately what the interstate system looks like today. Um, I'm sure you know, we're all very familiar with the ones around uh, you know around Columbus. So um, interestingly. Um, let's look at the U.S. internet system. So if we go look at a map of the cables that are physically laid in the ground, these fiber optic cables, this is a very high level um, view of what this actually looks like. So if we look at this compared to the interstate system, um, interestingly, it actually, the map doesn't look that much different. You know, the way cables are laid, you know, throughout the United States is very similar to that of which you know the interstate system is laid out, and again, there's a lot more cables than this throughout the internet. But this is just a, again a very high level of, of kind of what this looks like. So whenever you're you know hitting a website and you're uh, you know hitting that AWS region or that Google Cloud region or that Azure region, you are traversing these cables you know to get to your destination wherever it is. So what is it that I actually did? Sorry, I, you guys might be able to see that. Sorry about that. Um, what is it that I actually did at Facebook and Netflix? So what I said was I, uh, sorry, speaker is a bit center camera. Sorry guys, um, hopefully this is a little better. Um, so what was it that I actually did at Facebook and Netflix? Um, again, I mentioned that our job was to make sure no matter where you are in the world, wherever you are connected to the internet, photos and videos get delivered to you as quickly as possible. So to kind of, you know, summarize this into a service that I believe everybody's probably familiar with is we effectively built ways for the internet. So again, taking a look at the US interstate system, you know, this is just a, a global view of, you know, where the interstates actually, you know, live or, you know, are, are cut through uh, the United States. And if we actually look at a map of ways, what Waze does is it shows you the traffic um, and the congestion and, you know, potentially any outages that are happening, you know, throughout the entire map of the, you know, interstate system, as well as more locally as well. So looking at the Columbus, Columbus interstate system, you know, you have Waze here and you can see in, you know, some places we have, um, you know, some congestion, you know, up here, uh, you know, there's some congestion down here. This is, you know, what Waze provides us is this real time kind of traffic information. And again, this is what we were doing at Facebook is we were building literally the map of the entire internet. And, you know, just like Waze is building maps of our entire road systems. And what Waze does is they map this out for, you know, cars traversing or, you know, traveling between, you know, 20 and 70 miles per hour. Um, at, at Facebook, what we were doing was building the same maps of the internet when packets are traveling approximately the speed of light, which when you really think about it and you, you kind of you know map around the world, it takes about, um, I think 200 milliseconds for one packet at the speed of light, theoretically, to travel around the world. So it's actually kind of slow um, if you really think about it and if you have to travel, your packets have to travel long distances. So what Waze does for us in the interstate system or our roadway system is, you know, it maps us to the closest you know, destination to where we want to go. So say, you know, on 315, you know, there is an accident. Waze's job is to tell me what is the next fastest way now that this path is no longer valid. What's, you know, what, what's the next best way to go? So what it's going to do is it's going to take me to, to 70 to 270 and then, you know, around to, to my home. So let's say that there's another, you know, traffic accident or there's a lot of congestion on that route. Waze will take me, you know, a much longer route, you know, by distance, but it should take me there faster. And it, it knows hopefully that there won't be a ton of congestion and hopefully it won't add to the congestion as well. So let's apply that same thing to the US internet system. And we'll talk about, you know, this is like, these are the systems that we were building um, and we were making decisions, you know, we we're building these new maps every single minute of the entire internet. So at any given point in time, there are these different paths on the internet that are broken. Um, the internet actually amazingly breaks all the time. Um, and there's lots of different ways in which the internet fibers can be cut. Um, just, you know, common maintenance, uh, you know, a backhoe where they didn't properly, you know, get them marked off or they, they cut too close to a wire and that fiber got cut. 
Um, you know, this happens again, pretty regularly and more regularly than us as most internet consumers would actually you know, think. Um, I've even see, seen a major website go down because someone in the middle of nowhere uh, in North Carolina cut a tree, took down the wrong cable that was a major artery for internet for that particular company. And they basically took down uh, the site for uh, some period of time. And so it's really amazing um, that such like subtle things can have such huge impacts. And the fact that, you know, some of those aerial lines can actually, you know, be a major, major part of, you know, some portion of the internet. Um, and I kind of mentioned this, you know, earlier as well, is natural disasters are another big enemy to the internet. So, you know, obviously this is a, a, an image of a hurricane and, if you guys are, you know, using, you know, AWS, you know that one of the major regions is U.S. East One in Ashburn, in, in, in Virginia, and you know it's very possible that one day that hur a hurricane will come through and take out that entire region. Like I know Amazon's doing a lot of work to prevent that from happening, but it's very possible, and I'm confident one day that's actually going to happen. So, um, in addition to hurricanes, other really big natural disasters that are pretty. Um, can, can, can wreak havoc on the internet is tornadoes, you know, taking out, you know, some, you know, major aerial lines or even, you know, some in the ground, um, as well as earthquakes, you know, California has a lot of infrastructure as well, you know, US West one um, is based, uh, you know, in California. Um, and, you know, a, a big enough earthquake could take that completely out. Um, and also a lot of a lot of um, aerial, a lot of fiber comes into LA and even Seattle. So, um, you know, a lot of natural events can and will eventually cause a lot of issues on the internet. This is the same view um, looking at the global internet system. And again, this is pretty approximate, but it's really amazing that, you know, you can see like these really big places here, like Boston, it's a major ingress point for networking. LA, Miami is huge. Miami's, you know, they've had a lot of hurricanes lately. And, you know, this can be a really, this can, you know, cause a lot of issues, especially for South America. Um, that's where a lot of these, a lot of the internet comes in, you know, back to the United States. So it's really fascinating to see, you know, how, um, you know, the world is connected and how the internet is connected. So now that we kind of have an understanding of high level, the architecture of the internet, um, let's take a look at how that compares to physical good delivery versus digital goods. So Let's assume that um, we're Amazon, um, and this is, you know, Amazon was started in the 90s. Uh, I believe that the story is Jeff Bezos was um, kind of ticked off that he couldn't find a particular book that he wanted in any of his local bookstores. So he decided to build an internet company um, to, to, to be able to deliver books to anybody in the United States, no matter where they were at. So let's assume that when they started, and this is probably pretty close to the truth, is they only had a warehouse in Seattle. So you know, let's say that, you know, they, they're selling books to play people all around the United States. And as you can see, you know, they are probably, you know, mostly using trucks to, you know, to use the internet state system. Um, if you're in further regions of the world, you know, they have to use different hubs and it's going to take longer for that package to get to Boston versus if that package was, you know, going to someone in California. So um, you can just see that it's going to take longer, and especially if there are delays, you know, it could take you know, quite a bit of time. So let's go ahead and look at what Netflix might look like if they, um, you know, they were just started and Reed Hastings says, hey, I want to deliver this video. Um, they probably just started in California and, you know, close to where headquarters is. And they wanted to deliver this video, you know, throughout the world, uh, sorry, throughout the United States to different people, to, to, you know, to different consumers. So um, again, just as the interstate system, you know, can have outages at any point in time and the further you are, the longer it's going to take to get there. Similarly, video delivery is the same way. You know, those packets still have to traverse, you know, you know, thousands of miles of uh, of land to actually get there. As well as, you know, there's going to be outages at any point in time. Those packets need to be routed around, and the longer that packet is on a fiber, the more chance that it will be dropped at some point, or there will be congestion, or the more routers that it traverses. You know, you always want the mo the minimum amount of time um, for that packet to be on the internet. So, you know, kind of fast forward and, and, you know, Amazon became the behemoth it is, you know, they started selling a lot more things than just books. Um, but, you know, what they wanted to do is they really wanted to tighten the time that, you know, shipping, uh, you know, took, right? They, Amazon wanted to make it so that you didn't go to, you know, Walmart or Meijer or any, or Best Buy 
you know, to get that, whatever that gadget or that thing that you wanted, they wanted to get it to you as quickly as possible. And similarly, Netflix had a similar kind of problem where, you know, they wanted to make sure videos were fast. They wanted to make sure they, they, they delivered at really high quality, no matter where you are in the United States. So these are actually two very different problems. Um, you know, if you think about one's very digital, one's very physical, but they both have the same limitations, distance. And this is how the internet kind of, you know, evolved into, um, to, to, uh, to, to, to be able to solve these types of problems. So again, let's look at that single Amazon Seattle warehouse. And then, you know, when we look at this map, this is the US population density map from 2010. So um, as you can see, you know, the majority of the Amazon customers it are likely not going to be in Seattle. They're gonna be in various parts of the country. So you know, what they needed to do is figure out how do we actually deliver these packages really, really quickly to folks that are on the East Coast. So the way they actually solved this was with an interstate distribution network. So what they did was they strategically placed these different warehouse hubs all throughout the United States, overlaying that on top of that distribution map to make sure that no matter where you were, you know, within some percentile, you know, say like 90 some percent, 95, 98 percent of the, you know, of the, of the nation, that they could get it to you within about two days. You know, that's when that two day delivery, um, you know, thing started happening is they went like, where do we need to be to make this really fast such that, you know, we can deliver these packages. And you also need to think about the logistics network, making sure each of those things that are people are likely to buy are, you know, located in those different and warehouses. So it's fascinating, not only from a physical, um, you know, presence scale, but also the logistical work that, that went behind. How do they, how do they make this as effective as possible? So let's look at Netflix, you know, similarly, you know, Netflix is a California based company. The population density map, the people who are using Netflix is going to be nationwide. They're going to be all over the United States. So um, what they, they needed to solve the exact same problem. And what the way they did it was they created um, this platform called Netflix Open Connect, where they created these um, these these basically these really big servers that sat in internet exchanges all around the United States. So as you can see, um, this is um, a map of where you know many of these you know could be um, you know there's internet exchanges all around the U.S. and this allowed them much more quickly to deliver those videos. And also it really removes single points of failure too, right? You know, if, if for whatever reason, you know, California was somewhat cut off or there was major congestion, um, you know, all these bits were located much closer to users. And just a secret that all of these companies do, whether it's YouTube, whether it's Facebook, whether it's Netflix, whether it's Amazon, they want to get your packet off the internet as quickly as possible. The more time your packet traverses an internet service provider, the, long, the more likely it's going to fail. Um, so they want content to be as absolutely close to their consumers as possible to make them, to allow them to have the best possible experience. And when you think about photo and video delivery, these are, you know, these files are getting bigger and bigger, 4K, 8K, you know, they're, those bigger files, you know, they're not going to be able to traverse, you know, as, as long as uh, they're much more likely to, you know, to drop. So um, if we actually really look at it, I kind of simplified it there where um, I just showed you a couple different places where Netflix has caches. But if we really look at the United States, this is actually what it looks like. And there I'll just be quite open. There's way more than this. This is, again, just uh, just an example. But what they do is they actually will. Um, they will actually work with internet service providers all around the United States and they will embed caches directly into their networks. Um, and this is not something that just Netflix does. This is something that all of these companies do. YouTube, Facebook, Amazon, and even the big CDN providers that you use, you know, Akamai, Cloudflare, Fastly, they're doing these things as well. And they've been doing it for a really, really long time. So um, similarly to what Netflix, you know, has done here, um, Amazon also, if you look at their distribution network, they're actually distributed in this way. Um, and when we zoom into Columbus, we can see Columbus actually has a few different servers of, that actually contain almost the entire Netflix catalog, the US catalog right here in Columbus. So um, I don't know what your internet connectivity provider is today, but um, what I, what'd be, what's cool to do is go to netflix.com, you know, watch that video pop up 
And then you might see a, a, a little airport code there. And this is common across, you know, this isn't just Netflix, this is Facebook, YouTube too. You're going to see an airport code, maybe CMH, maybe ORD, maybe IAD. You know, th those airport codes tell you where in the world or where airport code wise your uh, content is actually being delivered. So there's a high probability, no matter who you're with, Spectrum Wow, um, that you will um, not have to even leave the vicinity of 270 to get that video. And um, I know this uh, from my time at Facebook, Ohio State even actually has a, a Facebook cache within their network. I was really, really excited. I actually worked on that team. I was super pumped um, when, when that happened. So hopefully internet's really, really fast. Uh, Facebook internet and Instagram at, uh, at Ohio State. So, you know, again, you know, what we did at these companies was we built, you know, these maps of the internet. And again, this is maps based on the internet of where these different caches, or in this case, the movie catalogs were in the world based on your actual network uh, location on the internet. So at any point in time, these caches could go down. Maybe they go down for maintenance. Maybe they go down because of a power outage, or as somebody in Slack says, you know, a lightning strike. Um, you know, we need to make sure that we are, um, you know, doing that in a very same way. And this could even happen in the middle of watching a movie. So you need to be really smart, both on the client and the server side, to dynamically track to move that move that traffic um, such that that user or that consumer or that customer never sees that buffering like that's the evil of all platforms video and photo delivery side nobody wants to see that you know that spinning uh, spinning circle so similarly if we zoom in and look at warehouses in columbus these are they're actually five warehouses at least in columbus when i last look on looked on google maps so this is how you know, google or this is how amazon is able to um you know, do same day delivery this is how um, you know, you're able to get the, you know, Amazon fresh, you know, to get those groceries delivered is because they've strategically placed these hubs in major metropolitan areas so that they can deliver things really, really quickly. I don't have a slide for it today, but you can even, you know, if you've ever in Amazon US East too, we, if, uh, um, Columbus is also a big hub for data center. So Facebook, Google, Amazon, um, maybe even Apple, they all use Columbus, um, because for uh, you know, major internet um, data centers, because for a few reasons, one, um, relatively inexpensive, very good internet connectivity, and um, taxes aren't too terrible. So, um, you know, the Columbus is actually a really cool hub for tech um, when it comes to a lot of this stuff. So, um, kind of in closing, you know, I guess you know, the goal of this talk is to you know kind of help you next time you you know, hit buy on Amazon, um, just kind of maybe appreciate you know how quickly. You know that package is going to get to you, and you know when you go and select that option, you know whether you're in a rural part of Ohio or whether you're in Columbus, Ohio, and how those options are going to change based on how quickly that that is delivered to you, um, and you know it's based on availability, it's based on where the warehouses are closest to us. Um, it's really fascinating the amount of technology and the physical distribution um, of the of the uh, warehouse infrastructure. Um, and then also, you know, when you press play on your next Netflix video or, you know, you go to YouTube and watch that video, just kind of appreciate, you know, the, the work that was done behind that, that traffic engineering to make sure when you hit play, it knows where that video actually lives, where that, you know, YouTube video is cached, and then, you know, optimally, you know, sends you there so that it's really, really fast and a really, really great quality. So um, lastly, uh, I'll just, um, you know, want to say, I'm my um I, I've been really fortunate to have worked at you know some of these companies and um you know I back in 2012 when I uh, you know left nationwide um and, or when I was even working at nationwide when I was in college working at startups wasn't really even an afterthought for me so um you know it's it's been really amazing to see in my almost seven years out in California how much things have changed and and especially in the startup scene and the venture capital scene and really just technology companies in general. Um, it's, it was awesome to see and made me really excited to come back. And, you know, I wouldn't trade my time out there and especially at those companies for anything career-wise. But one thing I'm more confident in this in 2020 than I ever have been before is that no longer do you have to move to the coast, to the East Coast and West Coast to um, you build a great career in technology. And I think it's really easy for me to say that today with COVID, but there's videos of me saying that last year um, after moving back as well. Um, so I really do believe this. And 
know, really that's one of my goals is to, uh, in, 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 in leaving these companies is I love Facebook. I love Netflix. Like I, they were really great companies, but I'm really excited to, to one is to spend my time and energy, you know, based here in Columbus and in building the community, the tech community here. Um, and also, and, and secondly, just building amazing, an amazing company, you know, I, I love a lot of things about those companies and I want to help build, you know, those, that next amazing engineering company, that amazing tech company, you know, right here in Columbus, Ohio. So um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. That was a quick uh, ending. <laughs> 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 Thank you so much. Wow. The scale of that is almost I, to quote Princess Bride, inconceivable. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, we have a few questions if there's time. Yeah. Okay. Let's see here. I'm trying to get to do stuff on my end. All righty. Uh, so yeah, it's it's really interesting that you mentioned League of Legends in your talk. I didn't think in an open source conference we would mention like League twice in 30 minutes. <laughs> and when you were mentioning like that you were going to say a political statement, I was just like, and then you just talked about, you know, your <laughs> editor. <laughs> um, so one of the questions we have is what causes packets to drop over long distances? That's kind of like a interesting origin question. Do you, do you know that one? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I imagine there could probably be this physics answer um, where, you know, over the longer something travels over a wire or a fiber optic network, the more noise and the more I'm not, you know, obviously I don't, I don't know these things. Um, yeah. but the more likely it's going to, you know, drop. Right. Um, so, or the more likely there's going to be interference, I should say. And right. um, so that's just at the purely like at the cable level. Right. And when you have cables literally strewn across the ocean, underneath the ocean, that's a really amazing YouTube video. Yeah. To watch. If one of those fibers get cut, like a, a ship comes and like cuts one of those, go look at a video watching how these ships go and repair those cables. It's fascinating. But that was actually the, one of the questions too, is like, is he going to talk about all those wires under the ocean and how it's, we actually are connected? <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Yeah. You have these, these, these cables and they have like these repeaters every large distance, but a lot of them um, yeah. that, that even make the internet work. And yeah. And ships will drop an anchor, cut one of those things. And it's very expensive and it takes weeks to fix some of those things, but it's fascinating. And like, that's literally one of the things that my team was building um, at, at Facebook was to simulate cutting one of those cables, like removing oh. multiple terabits per second of capacity over a cable. Um, so it's, it's just really to, fascinating. Just to do like the stress tests and. Yeah. To see what happens, make yeah. sure, make sure our networking gear works properly. But um, just to add a little bit more to the, 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 the question of like how things drop is not only do you have cables, you know, connecting and you have the physics there, you also have routers. Um, you know, you know, you have routing packet routing, you know, between each of these different places, deciding where it needs to go. You know, have, you have, you know, does it send it out this, this cable or this cable, you know, multi-pathing and in any of those cases, routers get congested. Um, they have to decide which packets to drop. And, you know, if you're, you know, it just happens and it happens all the time. Um, you know, it's a regular occurrence. And that's why we have amazing protocols like TCP, like yeah. transmission control protocol. Like its whole job is to, you know, make sure that it's not overloading, you know, the path that it's currently on to retransmit packets. Um, that's definitely, you should go check out the last year's talk if um, you're interested in that. But um, a lot of really cool stuff that, that makes the internet work. It's fascinating that all trickles down into us seeing that Netflix, like something went wrong, try again or whatever, That's, which doesn't that happen not much. When that happens. <laughs> well, you're not personally responsible. Don't worry. Not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> Did you have anything Vance? I have a list. So just let me know. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say there was uh, a, a question that came up. Oh in yeah. The, uh, Q and a, uh, someone was asking if there are any suggestions on career directions for, for, new people that are entering the technology field. Oh, that's... And, and I'll say someone was impressed in the, in the Slack about uh, uh, you making it through the interview process at, at Facebook. Apparently it's uh, pretty oh, challenging. Yeah. Hey, I, I'll say, I, I said it and I'll say it today. I don't know if I'd get through it again. You know, like sometimes you do well at interviews, sometimes you don't. And um, that was a common thing that, you know, like, I don't even know, I, I did hundreds of interviews there. And like, I don't know if I'd go and be able to pass it this time. But, um, <laughs> it, 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 and it goes for any company, you know, and depends on interviewers you have. And, but hopefully those, those processes are reasonably calibrated so that, you know, 
that's why you have five interviews. It's not to like crush your soul. It's so that <laughs> they get enough signal about your abilities, you know, because some people are going to miss things. They're, you're going to, you might do terrible in the Linux one, but kill the networking. And like, that's why they're, they're structured the way they are. Um, and I've, again, I've done a lot of them and I, I think it's, there's, uh, well, anyway, it, it, I think it's <laughs> to move on. Um, as far as career path, it's hard. For, like, I can't tell you, like, it's so hard for me to say, just go build things. Like, just go do what's interesting to you. I went, I, I, I'm really fortunate. Like I went and like went to Linux because I was so frustrated, not frustrated. Yeah. Because I was frustrated with it. Like I was completely Linux or windows at the time. The terminal was so crazy to me. And that's why I made this crazy decision. Like I must like pain where I was like, I'm just going to wipe all my windows systems, go to Linux and do it. And a year later, you know, I was pretty solid. I mean, again, I was much more comfortable in Linux. And this is when Linux was a lot harder, you know, back in 2006 as, as it is today. But, um, you know, as far as networking goes, I, I dropped out of CS 671 or whatever it was at Ohio State. I never even took a networking course, but I went and, you know, went to join a networking team. And that's what's really cool about like a company like Facebook is like I was a Linux and software Python person going and working in, going to a networking team. And like, so what was really, I was like working at this intersection between these different kind of disciplines um, like, I don't even know what I'm good at anymore. Like, I can talk a little bit about networking, a little bit about Linux, you know, some Python, but, um, you know, I, I, I'm just so your official title is like, yeah, jack of all trades. Yeah, I, I'm very much a generalist and I love it too, because yeah. I can go and like, I, I just like learning and, and trying new things. Um, this is a really interesting question. How would Netflix survive without distributed networks? Like I've, I was trying to think about that myself because it's just like I feel like a lot of these services came about because of the distributed nature of it, you know? Mm -hmm. it, it couldn't. And the thing <laughs> about these companies is they, there's no like, you know, when you talk about CDN providers like Akamai and Fastly and CloudFront, there's no CDN provider that could handle any of these companies. Like they are literally like building the internet and building internet capacity. Um, the amount of traffic that's going, you know, bet between these really local regional networks, you know, a CRAN um, in the in the networking sp like ISP space is just phenomenal, and and like th it just couldn't exist. Um, yeah. But that's what's amazing about you know their pivot from you know the DVD d d delivery to this. Oh um, yeah, so it's it's kind of that. amazing. It's like the internet literally made this happen, and then now they're pushing the boundaries of the internet. Yeah. Well, you are definitely pushing the boundaries of everything. My goodness, like the scale of that was amazing. Thank you so much for your time. I think it's, we're moving right along here. Yeah, you don't even absolutely. have time to show another Linux book. I was going <laughs> to grab <Yeah>. some. <laughs> um, yeah, I want to uh, throw things over to uh, Warner. He's going to be introducing our next speaker. So Warner, if you can, if you can come on the uh, session here. We're Thanks doing so the thing. Uh, and thank you again, Patrick. I, I, I always enjoy your insights on large scale distributed computing. There's yeah, unbelievable. Not, not much else like Netflix and Facebook scale, that's for sure. And glad yeah. to be hanging out with you again, Nexi. Yeah, you too. My goodness, like I'm kind of jealous now, but these are really cool too, especially for the season. Yeah, I, 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 like I didn't even have time to put it on yet. That'll be next. <laughs> this will be a limited edition too. Uh, so oh. only for the supporters and speakers and people who participated in our program this year. And Snorlaxes. <laughs> All right, very cool. Thank you. Heads up for everyone. We're going to be moving the YouTube stream 